Hi and welcome to What's Not To Like and today we're looking at uh, one of our own games uh, being reproduced by Pandasaurus Fire and Axe, a Viking saga uh, which when we first produced it was called Viking Fury and Asmodee produced a copy uh, and now Pandasaurus produces in 2015 and we're very delighted by the production on this and um, we played it recently as you may have seen on our preview and we're looking at it today, uh, some, of the, some of the points about the game and the way it was designed, uh, which I think have still got some very strong features, uh, and I'd like to share those with you. So we're not trying to tell you all the rules of the game, but obviously as we go through this, some of the rules may become apparent. Um, but if you have never played the game, um, obviously you won't get a full uh, explanation of the rules now, but maybe get a flavour of the game and perhaps go away and have a go at it yourself. Viking Fury was produced in 2004, which is a long time ago now, obviously. Um, but I can still remember quite a deal about how it was put together. The um, first ideas came from Phil, and he designed actually two Viking games. One was a, a Viking raiding game, characterised by a, having a pig under the arm and charging off uh, from the, uh, the, the place you've just been raiding. And the second game, we so sort of said to him, can you do that again? We really enjoyed it. But instead of producing a, a kind of raiding game, he produced a map game, a bit like this, um, where we had to sail around and raid and, um, and build up colonies and things. But uh, that was driven by playing cards. Phil always likes this idea of using playing cards for movement and for combat. And it was very, it was good fun, but in fact, we, we didn't really even get much beyond this part of uh, Great Britain. I don't think anybody actually managed to circumnavigate Britain at all. So we never really explored the game fully at all. That took two hours to get to there. Uh, I took the game on then and um, researched it quite a bit. And I must say, I learned an awful lot more about the Vikings than I'd ever realised, that they colonised down through the uh, Eastern European uh, river systems down at, uh, as far as Constantinople, and that they swung round into uh, the Mediterranean, and uh, went through some of the Spanish uh, uh, holdings there, so the cities, and, and raided some of those. Because I knew about Normandy and I knew about Britain, and I, I knew the history of the, uh, the Icelandic and uh, Greenland explorations, and of course, finally getting to North America. But all those things, it, it felt like it'd be good fun to try and get that all in the game, and so that became part of the objective. Um, and really the map hasn't changed much since those very, very first early days of putting that together. So the first thing I want to say about designing this game is this is a game that was driven by the theme. And it's great fun if you can find a theme that probably other people haven't done in quite the same way to really try and make it happen. Uh, as time goes on, I must say most of the historic themes uh, have been hoovered up. A lot of them have been done. And, and a lot of people are kind of going around second, third, fourth or more times on the same themes. But Viking Fury uh, was really quite a, a good look at Viking expansion, the Viking Empire, in a way that I don't think that other people have done. So when you're designing a game, if you can find a really original theme, if it's historic, you've got something to base it on, or if it's something that is, um, that, that's dear to your heart in some other way, then it will drive your game design. So that's the first point, really, about this design, driven entirely from the thematic material of the Vikings. The second point I want to make about it is that, um, as a game, it's terribly used to sort of think it is centering on uh, rolling the dice. It's got some really exciting dice rolling, three dice, and you can you can roll one at a time if you're raiding, and you roll all three if you're settling places, um, and you're just fighting against the numbers on the board, so you're not really fighting each other very much. Although occasionally you can use some sorry, rune cards to boost your fighting capabilities, so there's some nice uh, dice rolling things, and combined with that is a system of uh, trading, so that that actually weakens the position if you're trading to a place first of all, and then you can raid a place, in fact you can't settle until you've raided out the, the strongholds, and then finally that settlement. So that, that's kind of an area of the game that people would probably focus on and say, oh that's really interesting. But actually, that didn't really take a lot of designing. Um, I mean, it, it did to smooth it out and make it all work, but once you've got the thematic idea, there are all sorts of ways you can roll dice, all sorts of ways you can make something happen like that. We just needed a simple system, which is what we created. Now, the real, the real difficulty of designing this game was in the movement. 
everything hinges on movement and um, very few games um, really set about these days to tackle the problem of movement. So many of our games today are worker placement or resource management where things are really quite fixed on the board. Uh, there may be some movement, so by accruing and, and growing, I mean, History of the World is one of our games, you don't really move across the map, but obviously as you, as you conquer one area then another area, you, you kind of move your position. That's not quite the same as um, actually physically moving across the map. Let, to, to put uh, some sort of um, comparison for that, let's look at, say, chess as opposed to go. In chess, you have that tremendous ability to say move your bishop from one corner of the board right across to the corner. Or to move your queen across, or your castle, your rook. Your pawns can move a little bit, your king is very limited in its movement, but you've got that sense of movement in the game. Whereas in Go, you've got that general expansion of a position. So in a sense you're sort of moving your general position, but really things are being placed and positioned. When you get really genuine real movement in the game, you have to get some control on that in some way. We looked at scythes the other week and we saw how much um, uh, Jamie uh, had uh, controlled the movement in the game, limited that to some extent, so that in the game um, you weren't getting this over chaotic feel to the game, that you could see what was going to happen, you could uh, predict other people's movements, other pe people's ideas, and you weren't going to be steamrolled out of the game. Now, in, in uh, Viking Fury, in Fire and Axe, the the movement is, is purely these long ships, so you've only got one thing per player to actually move, nothing else moves, and it's just across the board in sections. So in a way that's a nice simple system. So easy movement is fine. If you play Monopoly, you roll two dice, you move forward. If you get a double, you move twice. You get a little bit of variation, but it's very straightforward. The problem with, with straightforward movement is it can become a little bit dull. Um, and so in a game like this, you really want the movement system to be very gamey. You want something in there that makes you think and work at it. Uh, and this is, I think, where we, we had to put the most work in, in designing it to make it an interesting system. So let's quickly explain, just to, if you've never played the game, how it works. There are seven days in each of your turns. So potentially your longship could move seven times. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Flying around the board. But of course that doesn't feel... That doesn't feel very realistic. Um, so what we did was said, right, well, in some parts of the board, you can only move um, uh, a more restricted amount, particularly in the north. And we have this wind dial here. So in the north, I've set it at the moment with the north, you can only move two areas in the north before you take some attrition and take some losses. In the eastern area, these eastern seas, you can move four. In the western seas, you can move five. And at the moment, in the southern seas, so down here in the Mediterranean, you can move the full seven. So, what does that mean? Well, it means that obviously you can't just willy-nilly charge across the board. And if you do want to extend the movement, you are allowed to by taking attrition. So if you move an extra two spaces, you would lose one man from your boat or one uh, trading goods. If you move three or four extra spaces, you would lose two. If you moved a full five extra, which only happened in the north, of course, you'd lose a third um, crew member or uh, trading good. So you've got this calculation now in all you do. Are you going to stay within the limitation and not lose anybody? Or are you going to push on and take some attrition? So that, that made the, 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 the sailing aspect um, much more interesting to play, but not interesting enough. Uh, and so that what took a lot longer to work out was, was this uh, wind dial. And the wind dial um, changes. So you'd be able to move this round. Now, they've done a very neat trick here with uh, Pandasaurus of, of giving you these uh, four openings. Um, and we didn't have that quite so sophisticated, just a small counter. But if you move this a quarter turn, just watch this. The blue marker now has moved to the west. And the blue is the best one. So this, remember, remember was on five. Now it's on six uh, movements. The north has moved to three movements. The southbound down to six and the east is down to three. So you start to get this ability to vary how far you can move in each seat. So if you're in the east and you wanted to uh, move quicker, you want to get this blue circle round to your side. And then you'll be able to move a full five here. Now the north is down to five, uh, sorry, down to four in the west, sorry. The north is at three, south is at six. Similarly, the north, the maximum move, 
set there with a blue circle is you can move as many as four. So in the northern seas, if you want to travel to North America, you really want to get this wind dial in your favour, otherwise you're going to take enormous losses. So that was a, that was a nice system, but again, on its own, um, you know, how are you going to get the turning worked out? And this brought in another aspect of the game. And so this is why I said earlier, it's great fun to design, because start to see things connecting up very nicely. We wanted to have some um, random card play in the game. Here we've got a, a nice card. This is the, the Sea Serpent, which is one of the uh, things that Asmodee and Pandasaurus introduced. It wasn't in our initial uh, design. This is where the Sea Serpent attacks a, a boat if it's at sea, and you can lose a lot of crew members. Here you've got Lost at Sea. You can move another player's uh, longship. Here you've got uh, change in demand. You can you can make some of the goods more valuable than others. So these are. It's always nice to have a whole set of um, of uh, variable cards. So you've got a set of rules for the game generally, and these are kind of the the game breakers. They they change what you can do and give you some opportunities to do things. So what we thought was, well, that's fine. Well, you can draw the, draw these cards and get them in your hand, play them out. But then the really uh, satisfying part of the uh, of the design was that. When you play a card, you're allowed to move the wind dial a quarter turn. So that gives you that opportunity to do something. It means the card has got two values. It's got one for what it actually allows you to do, and it's got a second one um, allowing you to move the wind dial. Now you can discard the card if you so choose and move the wind dial as well. Uh, and so we, we connected up there two elements of the game. So as I say, a very, very satisfying part of the design. So that is the... Um, that, is, that was the hardest part of the game design. So the final third part of the design that uh, I'd like to talk about is uh, linked to time. And you may remember already, I've already said that there are seven days of the week there. And uh, that's quite appropriate with the Viking, uh, um, Viking theme because, uh, as you may know, Tuesday is uh, taken from the Tue, I believe it's Tue. Uh, one of the, the uh, Norse gods, and uh, it's quite nice to have that sort of feeling of the week involved in that. So, um, these seven days are um, partly to do with moving your ship, and partly to do with uh, loading your ship up. So when you load your ship here, you also have seven days to do it in. So you might say, right, I'm going to put on board uh, some of these men. So this is a ship here. So I say, I'm going to put on board three men. That's three days used. So where's the, uh, put the marker up here, see? One, two, three. And then I'm going to put on board one uh, commodity there, one goods. That makes a fourth day. So I've still got three uh, uh, three days left, sorry, five, six, and seven, three days left. So my ship, which would have been over here in the loading area, can now choose to set off from one of the three start places and can travel three days of sailing. One, two, three. And lands up in the port. So that connecting up of, um, of time um, becomes uh, an essential part of the game. And what what's, kind of works well with this is that um, it's all to do with the movement, the time, and just that loading up. There isn't any time loss for attacking a place or trading with it or settling a place. It's all to do, again, with that movement and just that loading up of your boats. So you get this, you get this quite a quick turnover of the game. Uh, focusing on that movement, focusing on getting things moving across that board uh, and with just that loading extra element there just to slow you down and, and choose things. Instead of um, just loading you can actually take a room card so that will be another day of, of um, loading gone so that's another way you can use up some of your time. So as you're playing through the game um, you're going to be organising yourself time-wise uh, as well as um, obviously trying to get your victory points. So it's a sort of race game uh, to get victory points, which in this case is gold, by your settling, your raiding, uh, by completing sagas. But all the time you're working against other players so that you are trying to just get the advantage on them. Can you move quicker through time? Can you give up a day here, gain a day there, twist the, the, the dial around to give you a bit more chance to sail safely? Um, it's got a different feel to a lot of games because of that. And it, 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 works, it works really nicely. The final thing about the game I just mentioned is that it's a quite a cooperative sort of game. Um, you don't actually fight each other very much. Well, the Vikings did fight each other a little bit, but not a huge amount. You can work against each other with the rune cards, uh, so you can do quite a lot of damage to other people, but you don't actually very easily just get into conflict on there. So you're all working, in a sense, to build this empire together, 
And, and again, I think that gives the game a, a good, strong, fun element. It's an interesting design. It's quite different from a lot of games. Um, oh, well, it's different from any other game I know, really. Uh, and I think we're, we are very, you know, we, without being arrogant, we are very proud of it. I hope you get a chance to have a look at it and, um, and have a go. Uh, I think you'll find it worth it. Anyway, thank you again for watching uh, What's Not To Like. I hope to catch up with you again soon.